Today, the presenter is Daniel Mang, who's an associate professor in our Department of Psychiatry, and he'll be speaking about the use of big data to measure value of behavioral health care. I'll say a few more words about Daniel in a minute, but I wanted to just uh, start out by giving the usual reminders. So first, everybody's video and um, microphone will be off during the presentation. Um, if you have questions, especially at the end, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, at the, and you can see that button at the bottom right of your screen. Don't use the chat box, which is really just for the um, panelists to communicate with each other. Um, so yeah, put them in the Q&A box and then I will uh, just go through in order and uh, let Daniel know what the questions are. Also, it's very important that we get feedback from people who are um, attending these sessions. There are several ways that will remind you about that. One is um, at the end of the talk, there'll be a, the, a link to a feedback form that'll be in the chat box. So look at that at the end. And then at, on a slide at the very end also, the, the same link will be there. And then an email will be sent out tomorrow with a further reminder to uh, give feedback about the presentation today. Um, Okay, so now I'd like to just introduce Daniel Meng, who has been in our department, I guess, about three years or so. And um, but for those of you who don't know him, Daniel's a health economist and a health services researcher. His research focuses on program evaluation, comparative effectiveness research, and healthcare cost data analysis. His expertise includes statistical and uh, econometric analysis of large secondary data sets related to population health and health care. Daniel received his PhD in policy analysis and management from Cornell with a concentration in health policy and health economics. Prior to joining um, our department and the University of Rochester in 2018, he worked at Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania for eight years. And it also completed a postdoc at Penn State uh, before that. And I also wanted to mention that Daniel's uh, one of the four members of our um, uh, statistical analysis and data management core and really handles a lot of the requests for um, either data mining or database setup and things like this. So uh, having said all that, I'd like to now uh, turn it over to Daniel um, who will talk about uh, health economics and hopefully um, we, I think this is an approach that a number of us could uh, use in the near future. Thank you, Steve. Um, let me quickly share my desktop here. So here we go. Yep, so can everyone see this slides? Yep, all right. Well, thank you for the introduction, Steve, and, um, and, and I'm happy to be able to speak to you all on the topic that, that really is kind of at the core of my uh, my work in my career here. Um, so, um, you know, when Steve asked me to do this talk, it, you know, I, I thought, you know, there are two big buzzwords that um, that I wanted to kind of talk about. So, buzzwords are those words that you hear all the time, and you kind of know. You think you you kind of know what they mean, but if you actually think about it and try to define them, you don't really you're not sure what they mean really. So, um, and that was the case for me at least uh, when I. I came across these two terms. So um, let me uh, get started here. So first big word, the buzzword is uh, the big data. And we heard this all the time. And you know, I like this cartoon because that's kind of, that was my impression of it. And I'm reading what big data can do and what they're supposed to be capable of and you know what they promise. So you know, what is big data? And you know, for you know, forever for, for including my PhD dissertation and all my research career, I've been working with large data sets. So, you know, I was, you know, I was very confused to hear the word big data. I heard the first time I heard that word was around 2012, personally for me, but it, apparently it's been around for a while. But I think only, you know, only recently this word started kind of getting tossed around quite a bit. So what does it mean for us, right? So, you know, to, to someone like me, who is not a Data scientist or a or a computer scientist, what is the big data? Well, it, it turns out there, the way I see it, there there are two 
kind of features of it. So one is that it has a lot of information, right? So it has a lot of data, that's what it means. Um, so, but then you know, what do we mean by a lot? What, what is a lot, right? Um, and there are kind of two ways to kind of define a lot of data. One is how much data can needs to be and can be stored, right? So you think about it, you can think about it in terms of the hard drive size, right? Or the cloud storage space that has you know, one terabyte, one trillion gigabytes of you know, data and whatever. And, you know, that's the way they can think about it. But also, and more meaningfully, there's a, you know, there's a limitation on how, how much data that, that your computer can handle at one time, right? So that's the, the memory or the RAM size, right? So because there's, there, there are two different things. And um, you know, depending on you know, how much you know, computer, computer power you have at your disposal, you, know, you might have this huge storage space in your, your hard drive, but your, if your computer has a very low RAM, you, 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 that data might not be uh, analyzable for you, right? So that's, it could be large in that sense. But, you know, what it, but you know, at the end of the day, what does it mean? It's a data is large for us, at least, if a manual checking is not feasible, right? So if you just can't have a, 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 a resident or a, a graduate student or a, or, a, or, a, or a, you know, bachelor student to going in there and start manual like start manually you know updating things and that's not feasible then for all intents and purposes that's a large it's a big data for us but there's a second component to it right that kind of defines and distinguishes a big data from a from a large data so which is that that big data tends to be messy right so what do i mean by messy so meta messy means one, it could be it could be that it's unstructured, right? So it's and what does that mean? Well, it means that it's difficult to extract the information that you want or need at that time, right? Because precisely because the data were not collected for that purpose that you are thinking of, right? And that's usually the case in, in many instances. Um, and it's called it's and it could also be inconsistent, right? So some data can be censored, right? So in, in, in other words, censored means that the data available, but it's just not shown to you because of, of some regulatory or privacy concerns, or, or it could be censored unintentionally because you know, no clinical data available, right? Then patients don't come to come and see you and, and that they're talking to you, right? So that's, 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 that's the, the data that's not uh, available to you, right? So the data could be in, inconsistent. Uh, it could also be prone to errors, right? Due to delays in human behavior, right? And so human behavior can be, you know, we call it the clerical error, but I, I don't think, I don't, you know, I don't know what that means, but it's just the, the data is incorrect. You should, you should, you should say for reasons that, has, that, are, that are not correlated with anything else, right? So that's what it means. So, you know, what, what is a big data set? To me, it just means it's a large data that's very messy, right? So that's, that's the main kind of characteristic of it. Uh, there are two main examples of, of big data in healthcare, right? So if you if you think about what I just said in terms of you know defining the big data, that our eager records or the epic data fits that definition almost exactly, right? So uh, patients' information is stored in hundreds of different tables that needs to be merged. They they're called the they're, they call the relational data databases or data sets, and they they can be merged together by MRNs, you know, counter dates, and so on. And the challenge is figuring out where, where your desired information resides within the system. So, um, you know, I, I was told <laughs> way back when Epic was still early in, in, in this development uh, and implementation, somebody said Epic is just, you know, uh, paper charts, you know, converted in, in the electronic format, right? Shoved somewhere else in the, in the, in the, in the storage, right? So, it's just, so that's, that's kind of a, a lot of people kind of uh, you know nodded with that, right? So it's um, you know Epic is this huge company by in, in, in Wisconsin, and uh, in order for you to be able to kind of analyze the data, you need to go and and, and attend their uh, training session, costs about three thousand dollars or so, um, and you need to be certified, right? So it's a perfect business model. Like you you create the product. And you charge extra so that people can actually use it. <laughs> so that's a, you know you can't lose. So and that's why Epic is a huge uh, enterprise these days. So um, the Epic is a is a great example of big data, especially in healthcare. But there's another piece that um, that's not uh, often used 
at least in our clinical uh, context, right? So which is the health insurance claims. So this is something that happens in, in, in the back office somewhere, right? So when you treat a patient, you know, uh, you know they, they, they take that, uh, the work that you did, put it into a claims form, which is very standardized, and, and, and you, they submit to the insurance company. Uh, the insurance company takes the insurance claim and then they organize and store it in ways that they, they, they desire uh, the most. And it's, it's pretty standardized. It turns out that uh, claims, claims data are pretty standardized across firms. So, so if you see a claims data for one company like Blue Shield Blue Cross, you've seen them all basically. And it's, it's set up that way for a very purpose, for a very specific purpose of being able to analyze large, um, large number of records across companies for actuaries. So that's what they do, right? So they actually have, have actuaries who, who pour over these data and they're able to crunch numbers. That's, that's what they get paid a lot for that. So um, in health insurance firms, usually um, the, the, the claims data are divided into big three uh, buckets. There's the outpatient claims, there's the inpatient claims and the, and the pharmacy claims. And they're handled differently. Um, and I, I know that I know this because I actually worked at Geisinger Health Plan uh, for eight years, so I, I was able to uh, be involved in that or, uh, that part of healthcare. So, um, and one thing that's kind of challenging for us for behavioral health providers is that uh, behavioral health claims are often carved out, right? So usually uh, there's a, there's an external a third party uh, managed care company that specializes, is, is specializes in provision of behavioral health. Um, and uh, so if you wanna get health, uh, behavioral health claims, then, you, then, then you, there's a separate kind of step that you need to go through to get, uh, get that uh, behavioral health claims, unless the company actually has carved in, right? So if, for instance, uh, Blue Shield Blue Cross, which is a, one of our larger uh, health insurers in this area, they actually have behavioral health in-house. So that makes things a little bit easier for me as, as, as an economist trying to analyze the data. Um, and then on top of that, something that you may not know is that healthy insurers often have their own clinical provider team for disease and case management programs. And they collect their own clinical information, right? And they, they, they manage them separately. And they don't necessarily share them with the providers, right? So that's, so that's where the kind of disconnect can happen, right? So the provider, uh, has their own set of information about the patients and the insurer have, ha have their own uh, set of information for the same patient that may not be shared across parties. So that, that's another kind of uh, nuance that needs to uh, be taken into consideration. So for those of us who have tried to uh, obtain data from EPIC, right? This Dilbert cartoon kind of <laughs> summarizes personally what I've felt, right? So when I try to get data, it's like you, get, you first of all you, gotta get, you get you get frustrated by all these acronyms and abbreviations right and you have no you have no idea what they're talking about and and they're so complex that you know when you're trying to you know assess how accurate this data is there's just it's impossible so steve and i recently had an experience where we're trying to determine the number of uh, patients who are veterans in our system and we found it, and we just could not figure out where that uh, you know, ver the veteran status variable came from. So <laughs> it took a while for us to kind of figure it out. But things like that, that it, it, you know, even though you might think that data is already there and it's available, but once you try to verify it and try to, you know, to consider the source, uh, it, it takes a lot of effort and, and, and time. So. So what are the pros and cons of using big data in healthcare? Well, there, there, there's several, right? So what the, the, the pro is obviously that it's readily available, right? You, you've seen them, you've, you know, you're the one who, you're, you're, you're entering the information into the system. So you know the data is already available and it's collected as a routine part of clinical operations. The con is that just because it's available, it doesn't mean it's easy to use, right? That's, as, as, as I mentioned. Um, and it contains a lot of information, right? Both breadth and depth. And breadth in terms of the number of patients that are covered in this database. Um, but also we have depth, right? So for, so for those patients who we have been treating for, treating for many years, 
we have this nice long longitudinal record of, of any given patient that they can really uh, get a lot of information from. But the con is we can't really use it if you don't know where to look and when and what to look for, right? So that's why you need have this, you need somebody who knows the, the, the data structure, uh, how and which data fields are you know, stored where and things like that for, for you to be able to fully um, you know, use that information. Um, so another pro is that you can accrue large sample sizes for statistical analysis very quickly. So as you know, you know, one of the key things of, of trying to do stati any statistical analysis is having a large sample size. Uh, and by the, by the fact, by the virtue of the fact that uh, our epic data, it's, you know, it's, it's updated every second, every minute, right? So it's, we, we can get large sample size pretty quickly. But the con is, well, you know, if you start thinking about, you know, getting a clean sample. So for instance, you know, the research question might be, you know, what is, you know, how, how do, how, what, in terms of the depression score, right? PHQ not, for instance, right? And you're interested in, again, how, how does our service improve a patient depression score, PHQ not score over time, right? And you start thinking about, okay, well, you know, then we have to limit our sample to those who have at least a year or two, you know, follow-up data, right? And for those who had PHQ-9 score above at least 10, right? So you started thinking about all these parameters to kind of refine your sample. The, set, the large, what seemed like a very large sample starts to get small pretty quickly. So that's kind of the nature of the beast, right? So it's large, but like once you start trying to get, you know, some systematic organization to it, uh, it gets, you know, it gets small. Uh, and another example of or advantage of using uh, the, the big data is that it's flexible, right? So, so institutions can pick and choose what additional information uh, needs to be collected and, 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 and apply that institution-wide change very quickly. So one example of it is, uh, is our PHQ-9 score you know, collection initiative, right? So, uh, so from what I've been told, right, so that, that uh, we've been, uh, collecting a lot more PHQ-9 data more systematically, I think since 2018 or so. So now we have a very good um, you know, longitudinal data on PHQ-9 scores for our patients. But if I didn't know this, right? So if I, if I did not have this idiosyncratic institutional knowledge, then as a user of the data, I go into the EPIC data and I start pulling PHQ-9 scores and realize Wait a minute, there's like only half of people you know, pre-2018 who actually have valid PHQ-9 scores, right? So it's, and you'd be stumped and you go, what's going on, <laughs> right? So you got to figure that out too. So there are a lot of um, idiosyncratic institutional knowledge that needs to go into uh, to understand fully what these data mean, right? So um, yeah, I mean, there, it's, it's, so the short, <laughs> in summary, there are good things, and bad things about using uh, big data, and a lot of good things are, are in there. Just you gotta you gotta be careful. You gotta think hard. The the, the second um, buzzword is the word value, right? So um, I think again, it's one of those words that we kind of we think we understand what it means, but if you start thinking about it, it gets really confusing. And one of the reasons why the, the term value can be very confusing is because the value de depends on the perspective, right? So so you could be take on the perspective of the patient. Uh, you could take the perspective of healthcare providers like, 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 like us here in this department. Uh, or you could take the payer's perspective or you could take, even take the society's perspective, right? So from the, pay, from the patient's perspective, you know, what are the valuable things? Well, it's something that's valuable if it helps me to lower my out-of-pocket costs, right? So the cost, of, the cost is cheaper for me to access that service or that service provides longer quality of life for me, right? So that, that, that's, that's valuable to me as a patient, right? But for us as healthcare providers, right? What's valuable? Well, it's, it's, it's valuable if it provides higher revenue for us or lowers cost of operation for us, right? So that's valuable, right? Um, also, um, if it improves our, your job satisfaction as, as healthcare providers, 
that's valuable too. So that these are the things that we care about. That's how we think about value as healthcare providers. But for payers though, it's different, right? So they, for, from the payer's perspective, it's uh, something is valuable if it provides higher premium, right? Higher revenue, higher income for them and or lowers total cost of care, i.e. the dollar that's reimbursed to us, to, to us, the providers, right? So, so if, if there's an intervention that allows them to lower the, the amount of reimbursement that they have to make to the providers, that's value to them. But here's the thing, so you see a con like the, the inherent conflict there, right? So healthcare providers want as much re revenue as possible, right? Payers want to pay as little as possible, right? So you can you can see that the, the inherent conflict there, and that's that's one source of uh, of, of um, inherent tension that that's that's present in our system. But anyway, so one of the things that that I'm trying to do is to find that happy spot, the sweet spot where you you come up with intervention that's beneficial, that's valuable for both the providers and the payers. So, you know, for instance, when you say you know my my intervention is going to reduce the total ED visit rates and, and, and inpatient acute admission rates, that's good for the patient, for the payer perspective. That's not good for us, right? <laughs> so patients are kind of come to us less frequently, that's low revenue for us, right? So that's so that's something that, um, you know, we talk about ED reduction as a, as a value proposition, but it's, it's really not for us, right? So that's, we think about that. Uh, and lastly, from society's perspective, society's perspective you know, um, you want to have healthier and more productive population. That's, you know, that's valuable for the society, right? So having all these different perspectives, it's very important to articulate from the, from the very get-go, from the very get -go, whose perspective are you trying to appeal to, right? And who's, you know, how do you, so when you say value, value to whom, right? So the, you, you get, that's the first thing you got to ask yourself when you're trying to, when you're trying to propose an intervention that, you're trying to say it's valuable, right? Um, but more pertinently right, for us, can big data be used to measure at least some of these, right? So the reality is that we cannot, you know, get R01, R23 grants to address all these questions. It's just not feasible, right? That's not possible. So what the big data, i.e. our epic and claims data offers is, is, is a way for us to kind of you know, at least get some of these things, you know, without having to resort to expensive research projects. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of where I've kind of used uh, these data sources to answer some of the questions and, and you know, related to value, uh, value of the services that we provide as department, right? So one example is, is the evaluation of the prime initiatives. So you, you know, Dr. Oldham is the, is the man who knows all about this. So this is this is an inpatient program, right? So in, it's, a, it's an inpatient intervention, right? So this is an integration of mental health services in the medical units, right? So it was launched in July 2018, and there and we selected three sites, three units, right? It's three inpatient units um, for whom we would apply this uh, prime intervention. So, so prime intervention stands for proactive integration of mental health uh, care and medicine, but it's basically, it's a, it's a, more, it's a pro proactive model of, of screening patient, patients for inpatients for behavioral health conditions, as opposed to the more traditional reactive model where, you know, the hospitalist calls uh, 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 our, our uh, you know, CL, uh, CL psychiatry and say, we have a patient who might need behavioral health services, can you, can you guys come in and, and do something? Um, instead of that, you know, old way of doing this, you know, what, what Dr. Oldham and his team has been able to do is do more a systematic and proactive screening of patients before any urgent needs like that happens. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about uh, Prime itself, but I do want to talk about the kind of research and the research design and the data that we use to answer this question. So you know, what is the value proposition of Prime, right? So this is, so before we talk about what is, you know, trying to estimate or measure value, again, we've got to step back and think about what, 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 uh, whose perspective uh, we want to use, right? So the hypothesis was that the Prime can reduce overall length of stay in hospital readmissions, right? So why is that, and, and, and 
why and how is that valuable, right? So from patient's perspective, you know, that's, you could say that the lower length of stay is patient outcome, uh, it implies better patient outcome and implies better care experience, right? Patients would rather be at home than staying in their, in their hospital beds, right? So better they are out of the hospital, the better. Uh, from, the, from the hospital's perspective, right? Uh, lower length of stay implies a, a reduced need for hospital resources, right? So what that means is that Prime can feed, uh, free up beds to treat more patients and therefore higher revenue for the hospital. And remember for the inpatient uh, units, inpatient patient, inpatient care, we are reimbursed by DRG, right? So, the, so it doesn't matter how many days a patient stays in a hospital, right? So the longer the patient stays, right? The hospital loses this extra potential revenue because they, can't, they cannot admit patients. But from the patient perspective, perspective they, don't lose, they don't lose anything because it's, it's per stay, per DRG reimbursement, right? So hospital has a huge incentive to reduce length of stay. Uh, but then on top of that, we also hypothesize that, uh, that, that, high, that higher provider satisfaction would also result, particularly for the nurses, right? So that's one thing that we, all, we want to test explicitly. Uh, for the pairs perspective, again, I said, you know, it's, it's not so much the length of stay that matters to, pay, to the payers, but what may be very appealing to the payers is that what happens afterwards, after they're discharged, right? It's what's called a downstream effect, right? So payers are on the hook after patients is charged, you know, in terms of the kind of care that they use after they, left, they leave hospital. If Prime can, attend, can positively, positively impact uh, the, the, the lower downstream costs, that's a good thing. That's appealing to the, to the payer. So that's something that we might consider looking as well. And from society's perspective, I think identification and treatment of previously undiagnosed behavioral conditions could lead to better, pay, uh, better paid population and patient outcomes, right? So we can do this. We can, we can answer this question, uh, certainly for the hospital's perspective, by using our ERACR genetic data. So this is kind of how we um, designed this. So this paper has already been published, uh, so you can look it up. I provided a reference there in the, in the previous slide, but there are essentially three units that were selected to be the prime intervention units. And there are two resident run units that are considered the comparison group. And then we were able to identify patients who are admitted to these units and, 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 and define the, the intervention in the control group this way. Um, just briefly, and the, the point of this talk is not, is not the, res the research itself, so I'm just going to briefly talk about the results here, but basically, you know, from for, for between September 2017 and June of 2018, uh, we were able to identify thousands of patients, right, pretty quickly. And the nice thing is the data is still being collected, right, so <laughs> the prime is still in operation, so the data is still being, is still getting updated, right, so, so if we were to go back and update this analysis, we would have double the number of sample size, right? So that's the kind of the, the, the advantage of using EPIC for evaluation purposes. Um, uh, and um, you can see that there are some differences across the you know, prime units and comparison units. Um, and the trick is kind of, you know, because these are non-randomized observational studies, the key is to how, how, how to account for potential biases right, uh, potential confounders between these two groups. Um, so having, you know, I'm gonna skip all the methodological stuff, but go right to the kind of main analysis. Uh, it looks like there's a slight, there's slight reduction in length of stay. Um, and, uh, you know, it's this, I wanna point each you out to this second row there. So this is saying that, you know, there was about, we expect there, there are about 0.6 days lower length of stay for the prime intervention group and the p-value of you know almost significant at 0 0.08. So you know you can actually you know calculate the dollar cost associated with this, right? So you can say we well, had a 0.06 days reduction, right? So then you can calculate how many you know uh, potential uh, admissions that that were that made that became available as a result of a lower length of stay and you can dollarize it. Right and calculate the, the cost and you know and the and the benefit the cost benefit 
as well as the return on investment calculations as well. So all that becomes feasible when you do this kind of analysis. Um, I'm happy to talk more about this paper, but for now, uh, let's move on. So there's a second example is where I'm using the claims data. So um, this is a, uh, a huge intervention for us. So this was, uh, this was the, the uh, DISRIP uh, primary care behavioral health integration project that we did back in 2016, 17, and 18. So the background is that um, this, uh, the CMS uh, provided funding to the states, and particularly to serve the state Medicaid population, um, to really kind of fundamentally redesign how care is delivered for Medicaid population. Um, and then New York State got this money from the, from the federal government and, and, and distributed this money to the healthcare providers in our system in, in our in, in the New York State, and we were one of them. And what we've decided to do was to uh, integrate primary care um, behavioral health, you know, integration project. Um, because the the uh, district had a very specific goal of improving patient health outcomes and reducing total cost of care, that really implied that the value needs to be determined from the perspective of the payer, right? So that's what is very specific from the, from the, from the get-go. So that's what we're trying to uh, focus here. Um, and we're trying to define value uh, in terms of reductions in all costs, total cost of care. So this is what, what, does, what does that mean? This is kind of the insurance speak. So what all costs means that we don't really care um, for what reason the patient uh, was admitted or came to ED for, right? So it could be behavioral health, it could be trauma, it could be car accident, right? From the payer's perspective, it doesn't really matter. So they, so the key metric from the payer perspective is all costs, right? So we don't really care what the underlying reason is. We just care, you know, one reduced ED visit means one reduced ED visit. That's what they are concerned about. So that's that, that's the perspective that that I took for this study. Um, so between 2016 and 2018, uh, we, there were six uh, primary care sites that are part of our system that, that, that uh, were, uh, that were uh, integrated uh, using the primary care behavioral health model. So for those of you who are not, may not be all that familiar with this particular model, uh, is that uh, there are two dominant models right now uh, that's going on. So one is the, called the, the collaborative care model, CCM, or the impact model. Um, it's been published to death. <laughs> it's like there's, there's, there's no shortage of papers showing the effectiveness of the program. And there's even a paper showing the, the cost, you know, the cost benefit of it and the fact that it actually reduces lower cost of care. It's like that's already there, right? But the challenge though is that it's, it's a pretty um, uh, rigid program. So, you know, like, you know George Nazra, who, who, who ran this program, and tell you that you know, this CC, although we know that CCM model works, trying to implement it, pl implement it in, the real, in the real world setting is challenging because of very specific requirements of the program. And to me, I think one of the biggest limitations of the CCM model is the fact that it it's very disease focused. Like it's, 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 it's meant to dis treat you know, depression. It's meant to treat anxiety. Right. It's very it, it, it's and I think the reason why it's been published so well is because it's so neatly defined right? the population is so neatly defined. But the alternative model that we've decided to implement was the, is the primary care behavioral model. Right. So that's different uh, because PCBH model allows the treatment of a wide range, a wide range of behavioral health conditions uh, because it really relies on embedding a, a, a behavioral health specialist within the primary care setting. So that's, so it, it, what, it, what it does is that it's, you know, it's not so disease specific, it's, you know, it's more realistic, right? So, you know, the patient comes into a, a PCP office, they don't come in with just, just depression. <laughs> so like, you know, it's much, a lot more realistic, it's a lot more practical, and it pro provides a lot more flexibility. But the challenge is the evaluation is difficult, right? Because, you know, trying to define a, the appropriate population you know, for, for, for evaluation purposes becomes uh, all that much difficult. So that's the, where the, the large data kind of comes into play, right? Uh, so anyway, 
So this paper is actually uh, under a review uh, in, in, in Journal of General Internal Medicine. Uh, hopefully it'll come out soon. Um, so I, there's some I've encountered some challenges all right, of, of trying to you know, uh, evaluate, evaluate this particular intervention. So one is, well, the randomized controlled trial is just doesn't, that's not feasible, right? I mean, you cannot randomly assign patients to PCP offices, right? So, you know, you can't say, oh, you know, Dr. Man, you've been using this PCP, but now you've been randomized to a different PCP. So from now on, you have to go to this. That's, that's not feasible. That's not going to happen, right? So randomized controlled trials are not feasible. Uh, but we do have information uh, from the e-records and from their claims data. Uh, at the same time, though, if you're going to only rely on EPIC data, the biggest challenge is the fact that our EPIC data will not have certain cares that, that, or services that these patients received outside of the URMC system, right? So for instance, patients think patients can go to any ED in our, in our area, right? So they don't have to come to Strong, right? They can come to Rochester Regional. They can come to other you know, affiliated hospitals in this area. Um, not just for ED, but for other imaging services as well. So uh, there, are, there are significant holes where if you're only relying on EPIC data to capture the overall utilization pattern for a given patient, right? So using EPIC data was not really an, really an option here for us. Um, so claims data is a better data source uh, and it solves some of the problems, right? It's, but it still has some problems. So one is, Claims data do not capture the care, the services that were um, used during the period when they when their coverage elapsed, right? Or they're, they're switching switching plans, right? Uh, when they were uninsured for certain periods of time, or because they lost job or something, they right? They we don't have information on that, right? So it's not perfect. Um, and there are certain uh, services that are systematically left out of claims data. So, for instance. Um, so if you uh, have uh, end-stage renal disease, right, and you need dialysis, Medicare takes over, right? So it doesn't matter how old you are. If you need dialysis, you're eligible for Medicare coverage. So you're going to, so if I'm interested in looking at all types of health care, all cause, I'm system, systematically missing the dialysis systems for those patients who have ESRD. And also, as I mentioned, um, behavioral, behavioral health services can be carved out. So depending on the, on the claims that you're looking at and, 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 and the company that they're, you're looking at, behavioral health care might not even be available in terms of the claims data. Um, and more problematic is the fact that claims data are not typically accessible, right? So these are proprietary data belonging to the payer, to Blue Shield Blue Cross, MVP, Fidelis, these, they, they own these data. So they are under no obligation to share the data with us. Um, so what I did was um, after trying you know, several times to work directly with the payer, um, I was able to work with an external local community organize, organization called the Common Ground Health uh, that actually have a, a very nice and claims database going back to 2015 um, made available to me. Um, so it's, this is why you said it's, it's nice to have external collaborators. It's good to work with people who are you know, outside of your organization. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, having said all that, right, I was able to get the data. So this is kind of the scheme, it's, it's the schema of how, how the data kind of, um, I organized the, uh, the analytic plan of this of study, so there are six plans. So I can tell you exactly what what these you know uh, site which of these sites were, but um, basically these are the six sites. So it, it, six sites that became integrated PCBH PCBH for the first time at these different periods. So what's nice about this particular design, even though it wasn't you know implemented this way for research purposes, but for, you know, for, for admin purposes, but for, it doesn't work, it's kind of worked out really well for me. It, it gave me some variation in terms of when each of these um, sites became integrated. And what that essentially became was a, became was a, a staggered kind of stepped wedge design 
that I could exploit to uh, to calculate the the the, uh, the effect of the intervention. Right. So, so this is kind of how the data look like after I've you know uh, col uh, col uh, I've, I've collected and analyzed all the data, put it all together. So this is the highest uh, this high number is the PCP visit frequency. So this was which is what you expect. The PCP should be the most frequently used uh, types of healthcare for these patients. Um, and you can see that, you know, just you know, visually looking at PC visit rate went down. Um, this uh, dotted line was, is the frequency of the behavioral health provider for, you know, uh, utilization frequency. And you can see that it actually went up a little bit and went down, you know, and towards the uh, post 12 month period. I don't know why, but it, it but anyway, so, um, and then you can see that the ED visit rate uh, went down significantly. Uh, and during the first six months, and it stayed low for the next uh, follow, uh, following periods. Um, and there's no, virtually no impact in terms of the inpatient admission rates. So that's kind of um, you know, just un unadjusted kind of visual you know, analysis of the data. Um, and this is the more fully you know, summarizing uh, the, the full regression adjusted analysis. And what, it, what this is showing is that so you want to, you want the incident rate ratio below one. What that means is that uh, during the post intervention period, the incidence rate, the, the rate of the frequency of, of visits was lower during these uh, uh, post periods. And overall, it seems like we we see these kind of you know it, it, it confirms what we saw visually, right? So there was a lower rates of ED visits, um, no impact in terms of the in, uh, inpatient acute admission rates. Uh, PCP visit rate, rate went down almost 14%, but behavioral health provider uh, visit rate went, went up by about 6%. So you know, PCP visit went down, but behavioral health provider visit rate went up. On, and so on, on that, there's probably cost savings, right? Um, oh, sorry. So conclusion. So it's, you know, we... Um, Big data can be useful, but you know, don't don't be fooled by all the promises of what they can do unless you know what you're doing. That's the kind of moral of the story, right? So um, it can be useful depending on the perspective of the stakeholder, right? And and depending on the level of sophistication and institutional knowledge that you have on these big data sets, right? So um, you know, this is again, if randomized controlled trials were feasible, you should do it. Right, that's you know, you do, do, do the primary data collection, you know, do the analysis, right, and make it as rigorous as possible. But the reality is that you know, RCT is rarely feasible, uh, particularly in our world, right? So that's that's where the challenge is and where, where the big data can really help. But you really do need to know what you're doing, right? So you need to work with people who know the, know, know the data sources, who know where to pull the data, and know people who can handle them statistically, right? So, so you need a good team of collaborators to be able to use the big data in a meaningful way. Um, so like I said, you need to determine from the very get-go which perspective you want to, to take, right? In trying to establish the value of your intervention, right? Who is the audience and, and who should care about it? So you need to be, you, you think about that very carefully. Um, and I would recommend that uh, consider augmenting the e-records or claims data with other data sources to create even more powerful source of information, right? So for instance, what I've done, um, a different study that I've talked about here uh, is that because I have the patient zip code data, I can assign kind of the, the, the geographical level information, right, to each patient. So what we call the social determinants of health you know, uh, related measures and just try and try to see how that affects, you know, a cost uh, uh, you know, affects the utilization patterns for behavioral health and, and, and other medical um, uh, services, uh, and how that might impact overall uh, health outcomes for the patients. So that's something that you could certainly do, and you know, that's different other things you could you know merge into, right? So survey data that we could bring into, all these other things that 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 we can use to 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 make really you know, a useful and powerful inferences from this data. So, Steve, I'm a, how am I doing on my, on my time? <laughs> doing very well. You could even 
go for another, you know, four or five minutes if you okay. need it. All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty much done, actually. So I'm happy to take any questions, Steve. So. All right. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Daniel, for a very interesting talk. You know, that was really different than what we usually hear. Um, but obviously, this approach is getting more popular in lots of areas of science and certainly in, in medicine. Um, so, yeah, we had a lot of people attending today, over 100, and uh, we'll see uh, um, which questions come in. But I, I wanted to start with this one. Um, what would you say is the best, most convincing example of the use of big data in psychiatry? In psychiatry? So I think that's where we're lacking. <laughs> so it's like, particularly in the, in the field of psychiatry, I think it's still an evolving area of research uh, to try to use the, the big, big, big data kind of approach to answer some more important questions. Namely, I, 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 so to answer to directly answer that question, I really haven't seen a good example because I've I've seen a much better example in other fields like diabetes, like population health, public health fields. There are a lot of examples where you know these big data approaches have been used very well. In psychiatry, psychiatry, I have not seen too many, and so it's it's usually limited to very small sample size. Um, it's usually limited to a you know. Like a, handful of inpatient units, right? So I've seen other studies where uh, they've had similar prime type kind of intervention. And, and frankly, they have not been done very well. <laughs> so, so it's, I think there we have a lot of room to grow in this area, for sure. Okay. Um, here's another question. You know, almost by definition, the term big data seems overwhelming. Yeah. How does someone go about learning this? So How do you work with big data. Yeah. Um, I do not recommend going to a course taught by computer scientists <laughs> or data scientists. It's just, it's overwhelming and they start getting into math and like, stuff that just you'll never use. So unfortunately, I don't think there's a good way for, for anyone to kind of wet their feet at. Um, I learned this only by the virtue of the, the fortuitous fact that I was recruited by this large healthcare system that was very interested in using that big data that they have at their disposal to evaluate their intervention, right? So that was the stated goal of the, of the, of the CEO and that, that was the reason why he hired me. So I was in a very fortuitous situation to, to learn that. But for now, the only way for anyone to learn to learn and get their feet wet is just talking to our quantitative core group. <laughs> There's no other way, unfortunately, right? That's, that's the best way. Okay, well, following up from that question, um, uh, this question is now just came in on the Q&A. So what resources exist within our department or institution to help build a team of collaborators to work through big data? Yeah. So I, I'll tell you, I hope ISD is not listening, but ISD is <laughs> less than ideal in terms of providing partnership. And I can tell it from my personal experience. Um, so one of the things why we have this quantitative core is, is to precisely meet that need, right? And to help, to help people who are interested in using the big data to answer various research questions that, that they might have. Um, it, could even, it doesn't even have to be research per se, right? They're requiring RB approval and things like that, but it could even be just a simple you know, quality improvement initiative where you're trying to understand your patient population characteristics, right? Is just who are the patients that I've been seeing, and what's the, what's happening to our patients after they leave our unit, right? Like as questions as basic as that, big data can help, right? And we have the the, the quantitative data core can definitely help with that. So, okay, so you're okay. So I see you're recommending 
your group over the other possible group. And then, which is Feel fine. Feel free to try. <laughs> You'll find fine. that we are much easier to work with. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, what, what else though, is, is there anything else at the university? If somebody wanted to, I don't know, learn about this or do some online training or, you yeah. know, anything else? So um, I'm struggling to come up with a good answer for it, but it seems, so there's a, um, we do have, so University of Rochester, the River Campus does offer courses on, uh, um, on data analytics, uh, large data analytics. Um, I, can, I think I can provide even the course numbers, but, but I hesitate to provide, you know, suggest those things only because it's probably more than what you need <laughs> for, for, for most of our needs. So we're not trying to become data scientists, right? We're not trying to be trying to come up you know, with a, this huge predictive model necessarily, right? We're not trying to do that. So, you know, to the extent that all you're trying to do is to understand who your patients are, what impact our, our services could potentially have on our patients. That's probably the extent that you, that you need, right? So as most cases, um, if that's the case, then I, I just, you know, to me, I, it's very difficult for me to justify taking a whole semester long courses in big data analysis. It's <laughs> just okay. a waste of time. <laughs> I, all right, well, it seems pretty clear that our data coordinate department is the best way to go by far. That's, that's why we exist. So. so now we've established that. Let me ask you another question. Um, this is how can we be sure of or account for the quality of the data we use? Yeah. And this person wrote, uh, as a clinician, I can think of many ways the data can be compromised. For example, not including all ICT, ICD 10 codes addressed in a visit when billing yeah. or not choosing the correct ICD 10 code. Yeah. yeah, so this is the this is the error prone portion of big data, right? Um, and that's why you need to kind of think carefully in terms of what these data represent. So for instance, you have to understand that when you see uh, ICD-10 code, ICD codes, either in claims or in billings, they were, you have to remember, they were entered by coders, right? Who are not clinicians. Um, they're required pieces for any claims. So if you, if you find, a, if you see a claims form, there are lines that you have to enter, right? For ICD-10 codes to, as, as, as reasons why these services were rendered, right? But the key is they're not provided by the clinician themselves, right? So it's somebody else making this decision, particularly the coders and, and entering them. And they're usually good at their job. And 90, 90, I'm sure 90% of the cases, it's good, but somebody's making that, that non-clinical decision. So, I think one of the key things to understand when you pull data is number one, you need to understand. So talk to the data analyst, right? Who's pulling the data for you and say, help me understand these columns. I think I know what they mean, but I want to make sure where these data came from, what they represent and how I'm supposed to interpret them. Like, so it's, so it's, 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 a, it's this communication with the experts, the data experts, that's crucial, right? Oftentimes you say, give me the data, and they just plop down this huge spreadsheet on you, but it's just, you know, it's prone to, to mis misinterpretation, prone to errors, right? So it's, it, takes, it takes time. That's what I mean by, you gotta know what you're doing, right? <laughs> so yeah, that, it, it, take, it takes work. There's no, you know, it's, unfortunately there's no, you know, um, overseer of data who can definite, de de definitively say, that's right, or that's wrong, that's accurate. Like it's, no one, it's just, no, nobody can do that, right? Okay. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, there's basically two minutes left, and this is a big question. So <laughs> you may not sure. be able to get to all the nuances, but the question is, how can big data best be used to foster change in an organization and bigger level system? Yeah. So I think it comes down to leadership, right? So the reason, so again, going, hearkening back to my days at Geisinger, 
Um, it was the, the vision of the leadership to show that all these different interventions that they put into place, uh, different in a de delivery innovations that, that, that they came up with, um, he wanted to show that they, they had actually had real impact in terms of cost of care, patient experience, and patient outcomes. So that's the triple aim, right? There was that, that leadership level interest in showing that, right? And using data to support it. I think, you know, so I can't speak for Ben, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that's what that's Ben's eventual kind of vision is for the department, right? So, you know, I said, you know, the department, the, the, the field of psychiatry has been kind of lacking in terms of using data to kind of rigorous, rig, rigorously show the, the value of our services. And I think that's what we're trying to address, right? That when with the idea core that we have, uh, with the quantitative data core we have, I think that's the vision that, that we have. So, um, you know, what is the best change? I think, number one, I think we have an economic incentive to show our value, right? Because now we're moving away, as we are moving away from the fee for service kind of payment model, more towards value-based payment model, behavioral health is going to be right in, in, in the middle of that movement, right? So, you know, you got to think ahead and you got to show, okay, these are, you're measuring our impact, right? These are the patient. Number one, it starts with registry, right? These are the patients that we're treating and we're following their, you know, utilization and cost of care over time. And we're showing this tra trajectory of lower, uh, lower costs, better outcome, and better patient experience, right? So it really comes down to leadership. And I, and I think the reason why I'm here in the first place is because that we're trying to realize the vision, right? So that's, that's a big, that's a, that really is a big question. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we got some good questions and we got some good answers. So thank you. And thanks sure. again, Dan. And thanks to everybody for attending today. And again, if you're thinking of any kind of big data project, please contact uh, Dan. And um, I believe now that in terms of the angle rounds, we are done for the rest of this calendar year because the next two would fall in the weeks of Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we won't have another one till um, January. But I'll see you there and um, hope everyone has a good day. Take Thank care. You